Okay, my clock shows that it's the top of the hour. So we will get started. One of the chairs at least will be watching the chat. And so please put yourself on the queue if you, but you, you just use the meet echo tool to put yourself on the queue. You don't need to use the chat, but we will try to watch if for some reason you have trouble with the queue. Um, I will now go through the chair's presentation and then we will begin the regular meeting materials. Reminder to go with the note well, our ADs, I, I believe all of the ADs have asked all the chairs to make, to issue this reminder of BCP 54, that folks need to be respectful and courteous. We discuss the technical material and solutions for the global internet across a range of requirements and that everybody's here to participate. We don't get into personal insults or anything else. We have actually this time around been pretty good about all of this. We're doing okay, but we wanted to remind folks anyway. So thank you. Here is the agenda. It is not an especially crowded agenda. We have two hours and we're scheduled for 85 minutes. I wouldn't be surprised if some conversations take longer, but we're going to go through it. So, for example, the TWAMP draft will be up after I finish going through the chair's presentation. And then we'll go through the rest of these. I don't see any reason in walking you through this. This has been on the meeting material, the uh, agenda page. And we will go through each of these presentations. So but I wanted to make sure folks could see it. If anybody sees a need to adjust the agenda, please put yourself on the queue now so we can recognize you. Not seeing anything, thank you. Um, me meeting minutes are in code, code EMD. Actually, are they or are they in notes? Well, they're in the link that you get to if you click the note taking tool on the top of this. <laughs> uh, I think they changed the name for this. Right, uh, uh, one of the other ADs said it's actually notes.ietf.org followed in, rather than codeimd.ietf.org. I didn't edit this properly, it's my fault. Sorry, folks. Thank you, Eric. But the but link at the top will take you there. Please do help our secretary take minutes there. And to, uh, uh, so queue management, enter the queue using the tool. Mute yourself when you are not speaking. When you're on the queue, I or whoever, whichever chair is running things will tell you when it's your turn. Unmute yourself, speak, go ahead. If you are speaking, you're welcome to present, vi share video of yourself as well. Otherwise, please do not. And it is not necessary to share video. As you can tell, I'm not doing so. I don't actually have a video camera on this laptop. The session is being recorded as the little button on the bottom of the screen tells you. And those recordings are subject to the IETF rules as we shared them earlier. So, before we go into the other material, what ha what else have we done? Wanted to start with the adoption call on the compression draft. I managed that adoption call completion because my co-chairs were recused. That's why I'm presenting this material. The full details are at the link that is included here. The adoption call has completed. Please don't get words, word picky about what's on this slide. If you want to pick on words, it's the words in the message I sent. I've tried to summarize so people will know what the context is. So my conclusions were that there was rough consensus to adopt the document. Very rough, but rough consensus. The document, when it is posted, will include a spe specified open issue section. Separately, I am in the process of establishing an issue tracker because I do not expect the 
editors to be op updating the draft for every individual issue and every individual change to every individual issue. The open issue section is for major issues, as the text I provided says. We will use Git a GitHub-based issue tracker because that's what the tools people tell me is the thing we are supposed to use for issue tracking now. We will not be putting the draft uh, into GitHub unless for some reason the editors decide they want to. I won't prohibit it, I'm just not expecting it. And all discussion of issues will be on the mailing list. The issue tracker is just so we don't lose track of any. There was enough discussion and heck, I had trouble making sure I, I saw all the issues. So we will use an issue tracker to make sure nothing gets lost. But there will be a delay in posting the at the spring working group version of this draft until six men has in front of them not adopted not yet last called although that's in the issue in the open issues but in front of them a draft which deals with the relationship of CSIDs and RFC 4291 that draft may deal with more topics than that that's up to six men and the folks who write the draft the constraint from where I sit, because of the policy the spring chairs announced more than six months ago, is that we have to have such a draft to say that's the one we're lo we're, we're we're looking at to say that there is that the question is being dealt with. Not there is a discrepancy, but the question of whether there is one and how much of one and what the right response to a potential discrepancy is is being dealt with and so that is what uh, that is the delay my expectation is that draft will be the one that the six-man leadership is in the process of appointing authors for and there is a presentation from those from them in the six-man session about that draft if they don't post something that addresses this then we'll deal with it another way we'll figure that out when we come to it i'm not trying to write a adoption call conclusion that deals with every imaginable contingency. That's why we cope. Are there any questions about this? I do not see anybody leaping into the queue. I do not see anybody typing into the chat. I will assume people understand it sufficiently and thank you. Since IETF 111, we do have some new documents. The compressed sit list requirements document, the compressed sit list analysis document, both were adopted as working group documents and published. They're both there. And the spring SR redundancy document is now a working group document. So that we have, we're slowly moving things forward. On the first two, the, those now belong to the working group. The working group can work on them, improve them, modify them. Whether we will publish them as a as RFCs is a separate question, which will be decided later. We have two working group last calls going on, as far as I can tell. One is the one on the LSH document. I'm not going to talk much about that since I'm a co-author on it, but the last call is going on. And one is on the, the MPLS path segments. There are final editorial nits in progress and the Shepherd write-up is in progress. The Shepherd, Jim, just sent an email saying, guys, have all the open issue comments that were made been addressed? Because that's the requirement. Everything has to get addressed, not necessarily agreed to, but addressed. We don't ignore comments. So, that's where we stand on that one. It should be, the, the last call should be done soon. Um, we have submitted to the ISG spring segment routing policy. RAD Martin is handling that. Um, to answer Srihari's point, no, the question at this stage, there are different issues, there are multiple different issues. At this stage, the question for spring is not whether Six Men has blessed the relationship, but rather whether, whether they have a document that addresses the relationship. 
What, what will happen later is up to six men, but there is a coupling as noted in the open issues in the adoption call. When we get to the last call, we have to know what the relationship is and what happens exactly depends on exactly what six men says about the relationship. But I'm not going to prejudge that. Uh, as Eric pointed out in the chat, six men has picked a lead author. I don't know whether they're gonna have more authors or whether Suresh Krishnan is going to write it by himself. He's quite capable of doing so. Very experienced guy, but uh, that's up to six man. But thank you, Eric, for reminding me that I had seen that six man had picked a lead editor for that. We have nothing new on the RFC editor website. And with that, we are done with the uh, chair's presentation. I'll give folks one more chance to ask questions or get on the queue. Failing that, I will stop sharing. Rakesh, you need to put yourself in the queue. Click the start, you're doing so. Please click the start sharing button. And you need to request that you can, you, you need to unmute yourself as well. Uh, hi, Joel. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you, you hear me? Yes. So, uh, Joel, uh, I shared the, or you shared it? Um, sorry, you you it should good? be able to share it yourself so you can just drive. Okay. There's a, this, the, it should be the button right next to the one you used to, to join the queue. Should be share preloaded slides should let you share. Yeah, I made a request ah, to I share. I need to crank it. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Last time I drove, but it's much better if you guys can. Says the screen share is being there. It is. We're good. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thanks, Joel. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rakesh Gandhi, and um, I'm presenting the enhanced uh, SRPM draft on behalf of my uh, co-authors uh, listed here. So the agenda is: uh, we'll look at the requirements and the scope of the draft, the history and summary, and the next steps. So the basic requirement is to uh, for the performance measurement in SR networks uh, for end-to-end -end SR parts. Uh, it's applicable to both uh, SR MPLS and SRV6 data planes. So the goal and the uh, for for this particular draft is uh, no session reflector dependency for one-way delay measurement. So session reflector is is not aware of the measurement uh, protocol or some of the machineries. Uh, it's the, the state is in the packet, uh, the spirit of SR, and and, and we're trying to achieve a higher uh, session uh, scale and faster detection interval. So the scope is using the RFC 8762, the simple uh, TWAM a stamp protocol, and the extensions defined in uh, the recently adopted uh, SRPM draft in spring. So this draft builds on top of uh, the SRPM draft. So the history of the draft is uh, this draft was uh, initially published a year and a half ago. Uh, it has gone through uh, multiple uh, revisions and they were presented um, in MPLS in the spring uh, uh, working group sessions. So there were very good feedbacks received from uh, the working group and the latest draft uh, we believe addresses them. So in the uh, spring uh, SRPM uh, uh, stamp draft, uh, there is look back more defined for SR policy, um, where the packets are transmitted uh, for each segment list of the SR policy. And uh, what's new here is the, the session reflector forwards them just like data traffic without uh, punting them to control plane and, and um, processing them. So it's kind of, it's, it's agnostic to the protocol machinery. And this is what uh, allows to achieve uh, the, the higher scale and uh, 
faster intervals uh, for, for any violations. So, so in, in, the, in the existing uh, working group document, uh, we can measure the round trip delay only. So in the enhanced mode, uh, that's using the network programming function, um, it, it, it optimizes the, the, the operations, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, timestamp is uh, added in the packet. So uh, 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 at a particular location using network, fun network programming function for SRMPLS and SRV6, um, uh, it, it adds the received timestamps and forwards the packet just like data packet. So this allows us to uh, measure one-way delay uh, for the end-to-end -end path. Uh, it uh, extends the SRPM provisioning model by defining a new uh, measurement mode. We call it enhanced loopback mode, uh, as well as uh, the uh, network programming function, which includes the timestamp label for MPLS or the SRV6 endpoint behavior. Uh, that will come with its uh, offset uh, in the stamp, uh, which is a 16 and 32 bit in the um, uh, um, uh, different modes of the packet format. Uh, and that's basically. I may stop you for a moment. Somebody is misunderstood something or something you said didn't add up right. Can I let Greg ask you a question about what you've said just a few minutes ago for clarification? Sure, yeah. Greg, please go ahead. Try to by the context since we flipped a few slides. Yes, uh, thank you, Rakesh. So um, you're saying that uh, this method enables uh, one-way measurement. At That's same, right. Uh, at the same time, you are saying that uh, the reflector doesn't have a state and uh, uh, the packet does not leave the data plane. Right. Um, so um, how you can do that uh, if uh, the uh, format of um, the reflected packet is different from the format of the uh, received packet from the sender. So uh, they are very different and uh, you cannot really just take um, the packet and uh, swap their destination and source address. Uh, more so, um, if you uh, don't have a state in the reflector, what you are measuring, you're not measuring one way, you're measuring round trip. And because uh, you are traversing uh, one way uh, or downstream uh, their segment tunnel and the upstream, uh, I don't know, uh, I can assume uh, it's IP network. So they're divided by two, the round trip time, uh, might be um, not characteristic, um, not accurate. So I think that there is some serious problem with this. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so the loopback uh, measurement mode is defined in the working group document, and it explains uh, um, how it works for the SR policy uh, with uh, a proper header and whatnot. Um, you had some good comments and the draft was uh, updated to address those comments. So if you, uh, if you can have a look at this uh, working group document, please, and let us know mm -hmm. if you have additional comments. But this, that, so that is for the round trip delay. And the, this is an optimization uh, where the session reflector uh, using the network programming function adds the receive uh, timestamp and forwards the packet. So the packet um, processing is also explained in the enhanced loopback mode draft on how it works. So if you could uh, have a look at that and let us know your comments, uh, would be mm -hmm. appreciated. Yeah, uh, I had, and uh, I, I sent the um, comment uh, before the meeting. So, uh, Again, I, I see that there is a contradiction uh, between the statements uh, because uh, their segment routing programming has nothing to do or does not introduce any special mode in the stamp. Um, so uh, to do processing of uh, stamp packets in a uh, real one-way uh, measurement, um, reflector has to be stateful. So, uh, 
encapsulation of um, their underlay of the network uh, is uh, really not relevant. Yeah, so draft well, explains I, it and uh, there is okay. a summary. Okay, I, I apologize. Uh, I just will leave with this, okay? So we can continue on the mailing list, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I haven't seen your latest mail, uh, if you just sent it, but I will reply to it. So uh, stamp test packets are shown here. Uh, and the idea is that the sender sends the transmit uh, timestamp T1 in the uh, session sender packet uh, and the reflector adds the receive timestamp T2 at offset 16 in an authenticated mode and offset uh, 32 in the authenticated mode. So uh, uh, these are uh, 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 well-defined uh, locations in the stamp packets. Uh, this is motivation for using stamp as well. Um, and and there is uh, uh, for SR MPLS timestamp MPLS label is uh, defined. Uh, this is network programming function uh, which will um, cause the reflector node to do the adding of the timestamp and forward the packet. Uh, there are two ways of achieving this. Uh, reverse path can be IP, uh, where MPLS header will be removed and the source destination address in the IP header of the packet will make, make sure the packet comes back to the sender or reverse path can be SRMPLS where the entire label stack is carried in the packet. So this is an example uh, of a, a reflector receives a packet uh, with timestamp for label TBA1. It will cause the reflector to add timestamp label two, sorry, timestamp two and forward the packet back to the uh, sender. Uh, in case of SRV6, uh, there are uh, uh, two new end functions uh, defined uh, for the two different offsets. Uh, idea is very similar uh, where um, timestamp two will be added by the reflector um, and the reverse path can be IP or SRV6. Uh, in a similar way, uh, entire uh, the seed list is carried if reverse path is uh, SRV6 in SRV6. Um, the, the, the notifications are, uh, uh, the thresholds are provisioned. So uh, what we are measuring one way delay. So uh, a threshold is configured and notification is generate, generated uh, when the threshold is crossed. Same way for the synthetic packet loss. Uh, session state is, uh, this is mentioned in the existing working group document where the state uh, up or down is declared based on if packet is being received or not. Uh, so welcome your comments and suggestions. Uh, many thanks for the great discussions on the SRPM draft during the working group adoption. Uh, and uh, looking forward to your comments on this draft as well. And we are requesting a spring working group adoption for this draft as well. And many thanks. Any comments, questions? For the requesting, please send an email and Shraddha will add it to the list. But people are getting on the queue right now. Stuart, you're first. So um, I'm curious as to how you avoid the ECMP issue with this, that uh, ECMP will give you a different answer when you, um, when you run this. Is this ECMP safe? Is it for MPLS? Uh, Yes, yeah, so uh, I mean for ECMP, um, there are standard uh, techniques of, uh, for example, using the um, um, entropy label. So, uh, if, if you're... so you requ so you're requiring the entropy label to be in there for an ECMP safe measurement. That's absolutely fine, but you must say that it must be there. Ah, uh, okay. Because you yes. don't show it there in the stack I was just looking at. Yes, yeah, we, we can uh, add that uh, to no, it. It has to be, it has to be, you know, high level required because um, people will get the wrong answer and we can't publish a document where people get the wrong answer. Yeah, definitely. A good comment, Steve. We'll add it. Okay, Andrew, you're up. Oh, um, thanks. Uh, just a quick question. I noticed that in the case of the IP side, you're setting the session sender 
sets the destination equal address equal to the session sender address, etc. Effectively, they're, they're going out reversed, lying on the labels, if I'm reading this correctly, to get to the other path. Now, my question on this would be, what is the, what is the impact on stuff like DCP38 on a network that is running multiple ASNs, etc., that is actually protecting against, you know, incorrect source, incorrect estimation, etc., on incoming, particularly considering, I mean, we, we use a lot of TWAMP, etc., for various probes, and that reversal of addresses does kind of worry me. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on you know, the impacts, the potential impacts on things like BCP38 and anti-spoofing protection. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks, Andrew, for the question. Um, so, yeah, if uh, that is not uh, suitable for the network, uh, so the second method, which is um, reverse path, uh, uh, can be SRMPLS, so the node seed or the entire label stack uh, can be used to bring the packet back to the sender. Uh, so both met methods are uh, defined, uh, and depending on the um, the deployment or what is uh, what is being used in the network, uh, one of them can be selected. Uh, again, this is uh, this has been around many RFCs use uh, swapping of the source addresses uh, already, uh, and it's uh, also no different here. to explore it more, take it to the list. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rakesh. I don't see any more people in the queue. There are some issues which you're going to have to deal with on the list, but that's fine. So you need to push the stop sharing button so that Yongxing can start sharing for the next presentation. Okay, we just wait for the tool to catch up there. Your slides are now shared. Go ahead, Yongxing. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead. Ah, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Yongxing Zhu from Chan Telecom. Today, my presentation is second routing for end-to-end -end ITF network slash as we know, network, network slicing can be used to meet the connectivity and the performance requirements of different services or customers in a shared network. And ITF networks can be realized by mapping one, one or group of overlay VPNs to a VTN as the underlay. Furthermore, an end-to-end -end ITF network slice may span multiple network domains. In each domain, ITF network slice traffic needs to be mapped to a local VTN. Here, in this doc document, we describe the SSR extension to support end-to-end -end ITF network slice. Let's have a look at the ITF network slice framework and the realization. There are three parts of the uh, three parts for this framework. The sec the first one is concepts and the general framework, which described which is described in the draft ITF T's ITF network slices. The second one is re real realization. Realization 
framework based on VPN, T, and other technologies, which is described in draft ITF test enhanced VPN. And the last one is framework of end-to-end -end ITF network slides. As to the realization, there are some there's there's some there's some some, some draft. The first uh, the first uh, one is the uh, ARSA based network slice re realization. We can achieve it by making use of the SI resource aware segments. The second one is the scalable network slice re realization. We can achieve it by making use of a data plane between resource ID. And the third one is the end-to-end -end ITF network slice, which introducing which, which introduce global VTN ID and mapping mechanisms. Here, our pro our proposed draft the spring SR E2E ITF network slicing. <coughs> It's uh, listed here. In in this draft, we introduce the VTN bonding segment. The VTN bonding segment, that is to say, the B seed is a special B seed used by the domain ad nodes to steer traffic into a local VTN. The VTN B seed can be instantiated with SRV6 or SRMPRC plane. There are four functions for the VTN B seed. The first one is the end dot B6 in caps, which maps the map, map, map the packet to a list of resource aware segments, which which are as associated with the uh, local VTN. This function, as for the SRV6, it, uh, it equals, equals, <coughs> equal to the SRV6 and, and the B, and, and dot B6 in caps function. The second, the second function is, is and dot VTN in caps. This function determines the local VTN ID based on local mapping information and instructs the encapsulation of the local VTN ID to the data, to the data package. The second one is end dot BVTN dot in caps. This function obtain the local VTN ID from the package and the impact and the instructs the encapsulation of the local VTN ID to the data packet. The last one is the end.b6vtn.incaps. This function identify an SR policy which is bound to a local VTN. As for SRV6, all the above functions use the use, use, use the uh, uh, use in the SRV V6. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have we have talked about it on the uh, on on the last slides. Uh, there are some there are some there, there are some a uh, suit, uh, suit, suit code uh, for the uh, for the for for these and for these functions. Uh, 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 for example, the end dot vtn dot in caps. Uh, for the s s fourteen, we use this the up, update up IPv6 D with a segment list. And and next the set the VTN ID option to V in the hop by hop extension header. Uh, <clears throat> and the other the other functions such as and and B VTN and in caps 
and the and the dot b6 within dot incaps function as a as a very as a basic function is <coughs> listed listed here and the within b6 in as a as a and plus is similarly is 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 similar within b6 can be instantiated shaded using as and plus binding states with different uh, semantic uh, semantics you can refer to the draft for the details. Next, uh, we will <coughs> refine this draft and uh, welcome the comments and the feedback. Feedback. Thank you. Any questions? Does anybody wish to get in the queue? Vishnu, go ahead. This is Pawan Biram. Uh, Jaybar, can you go to slide three, uh, if you can? The one where you uh, showed all the relevant draft documents that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if there is difficulty in going to slide three, I'll just go ahead and state my question. So we do have a working group adopted framework document in T's, like you pointed out for what we call uh, IETF network slices. So though the original interest from the working group participants was um, largely with respect to how uh, the IETF network slice can cater to what uh, the industry refers to as transport slicing, uh, there hasn't really been any conscious attempt uh, either by the authors or the working group to limit the scope of that uh, construct. So I don't quite get the idea of a, uh, of having a separate end-to-end -end slicing framework document. So if, if all that this document is talking about is about how you can go ahead and stitch multiple VTNs together, I would limit the scope of this document to that and talk in terms of stitching VTNs together instead of uh, putting this under pages or something like a end-to-end -end slicing uh, term. That's my comment. Yang Xing, do you want to respond before we go to the next person? OK, Xi, go ahead. Hi, uh, I just want to uh, help to reply to having the comments on the end-to-end slice framework draft. Actually, that one will be presented uh, tomorrow in the test session. And uh, this document is mainly about the segment routing-based uh, extension to solve this uh, multi-domain mapping and the concatenation uh, issue we want to solve. Okay, We can discuss further about the end-to-end slicing framework in the TIS meeting. Okay, Adrian. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I, speaking as the editor of the T's network slicing framework, which is intended to be sort of all embracing for IETF network slices, I want to caution the authors here to be very careful about the term end to end uh, because the the concept of an end-to-end -end network slice has already been uh, used by 3GPP to mean something much broader of which an IETF technology network slice would form only part. So um, I think uh, take a little bit of care, um, especially as well that that the, the concept of end has uh, has a, a strange meaning in in IETF. So um, maybe step back from um, that headline title of end-to-end -end IETF network slice and talk um, more about what it is you're you're achieving rather than getting hooked on that terminology. Thank you, Adrian. Yongsheng, if you will stop sharing, we will now move on to the next presenter. Saleh, I believe you are next, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. Yeah, there. So you should try. To, you should 
just uh, click the share button and then I will give you permission to do so. There you go. And now as soon as they actually appear, there you are. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Salih uh, from Juniper Networks. Uh, today, I am presenting SRV6 uh, inter-domain mapping sheets uh, on behalf of my co-authors. So this draft introduces three new SRV6 endpoint behaviors, uh, namely n.replace, n.replace b6, and n.db6. These seeds help in building SRV6 path spanning multiple SRV6 domain. So we will get SRV6 uh, continue, service continuity over multiple SRV6 transport domains. Each domain can have its own T mechanisms. Uh, so this, the, among the three slides, the end dot replace and end dot replace B6 seeds helps in transporting their working. Uh, so this seeds also helps when uh, there are multiple intent based paths present in the network. Uh, so in such scenarios also, this mechanism ha can help in getting uh, easy stitching. Uh, that means it can work with uh, the procedures mentioned under BGP classical transport or similar mechanisms uh, uh, for getting uh, multiple end-to-end intent-based paths across the network. Uh, so the last seed end dot db6, uh, it, it helps in uh, service in the working. Uh, so now we will look at uh, the two use cases. Uh, the first use case is for the transport in the working. Uh, so this this use case is uh, from the seamless SR draft. Uh, so basically, uh, the figure shows uh, three different ASs: AS1, AS2, and AS3. The ASPR1 to ASPR8 uh, are border nodes between the ASs. A given ASPR runs eBGP session with the ASPRs in the adjacent ASs. The ASPR also runs IBGP sessions with the other ASPRs in the same uh, AS. Uh, RRs can also be used to achieve the full mesh of IBGP requirements. Uh, so uh, instead of IBGP or EBGP, this can also be replaced with the uh, intent-based BGP CT or similar mechanisms. Uh, so these seats uh, actually helps in replacing the destination address uh, in the in, uh, incoming packet. Uh, one thing to note is there is no segment list change uh, with respect to these two seeds. Uh, uh, the next slide. Yeah, so the processing of uh, end dot replace. Uh, so this uh, actually replaces the destination address with a new seed and forward the packet on an outgoing interface. So this idea is similar to the swap operation on an MPLS uh, data plane. Uh, there is no segment list change, uh, uh, segment left change, uh, and it cannot be the last seed uh, for the in the SRH. The procedure is mentioned in the uh, draft. Uh, when SRH is processed uh, after doing the initial checks, uh, decrement IPv6 op limit by one, uh, update IPv6 destination address with the new destination address mapped with the end dot replace it to so submit the packet to the ipv6 module for transmission to the new destination via the member of j uh, where it belongs to one of the uh, one or more of the adjacencies of bgp uh, so one uh, thumb rule is for a route if the bgp next stop is one hop away uh, then while advertising we uh, we use end dot replace it uh, the a detailed uh, procedure uh, probably we will update in the next version of the draft uh, with an example. Uh, so end dot uh, so the next seed uh, uh, is end dot replace b6. So this is uh, where the apart from replacing the destination address with a new seed, it will also add an uh, an additional SRV6 header. So this is similar to a swap and push in the MPLS uh, data plane. Uh, here also, there is no segment left uh, change, uh, and it cannot be the last seed in the SRH. Uh, for a route, uh, if the next stop is multi-hop away, then while advertising, we pick n dot replace b6 uh, seed. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the uh, in the draft, when an SRH is processed after the initial uh, checks, uh, decrement IPv6 op limit by one. Update the IPv6 destination address with the new destination address mapped with n.replace v6. 
push an ipv6 adder with the sarh set out ipv6 source address equal to the source address the address of the border node so set the outer payload length traffic class hop limit and flow label fields set the outer next stop header value submit the packet to ipv6 module for transmission to the first hit yeah so the second use case is uh, for the service interworking uh, so here there are two srv6 domain uh, as1 and as2 uh, the services are running between pe1 and pe2 in option b style um, uh, so the abrs can also be rrs so there are no vrf configs at uh, the abrs or rrs the self next stop is configured at uh, the rrs uh, the requirement here is to avoid service route lookup on abr1 and abr2 to provide an option b style end to end connectivity uh the at rr uh, we we de we decapsulate the received srv6 header and encapsulate a new srv6 header with source address uh, same as the rr so uh, like mentioned like the sid decapsulate the receiver received srv6 header and encapsulate a new srv6 header Uh, when an SRH, the procedure is mentioned in the draft, uh, like when an SRH is re received uh, after the checks, remove the uh, outer IPv6 header with all its extension headers, uh, push the new IPv6 header with the SRV6 seeds associated with the end dot DB6 seed uh, in an SRH, set outer IPv6 SA equal to the T and out IPv6 destination address to the first seed in the segment list, set of outer payload length, traffic class, hop limit, and flow label fields. Set the outer next header value. Submit the packet to the IPv6 module for the transmission to the first hit. Yeah, so uh, these. Uh, so we request uh, the working group to review the document and provide comments and feedback. Okay, thank you, Sala. There is there are some questions in the queue. Jenbin. Hello. Yeah, hi. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is Jinbin from Huawei. Uh, so mm -hmm. my understanding, the end replace is uh, similar as the uh, uh, mapping uh, the swap uh, function of MPRS, but uh, I, I'm a uh, uh, because I, I'm not sure I, my understanding is right or not because in the uh, SRV6, I, I don't think we need not the swap because this is the segment list. Uh, Can be encapsulated as this the ingress node, so that there's not necessary to swap the uh, segment in the uh, midpoint. So why uh, we introduce this the end replace uh, function for the seed? Yeah, okay. So basically, there are different mechanisms for multiple domain uh, uh, when there are multiple domains involved. Like the ingress itself is computing the full path, uh, or a PC is involved. So this mechanism is where, where the BGP is involved for stitching the end-to-end -end path. Uh, these domains are heterogeneous, and uh, uh, there is actually on the borders there is self uh, the the protocol reachability is not uh, leaked or not learned by the ingress uh, PE1. It is actually stitched automatically by BGP. So this is for option C connectivity. Across multiple uh, domains, so this is another way to address the same thing. Uh, okay, okay. Katan, you're next. Uh, thanks uh, for your draft and uh, for the presentation. Um, my question was on the end. Dot, uh, Somebody has a lot of background noise. Make sure. You are muted if you are not speaking. Thank you. Go ahead, Ketan. Uh, my question was on the n dot uh, db6, uh, uh, sorry, uh, on the pseudocode for that. So this is uh, was a service uh, kind of a mapping, right? So binding. Uh, my question is uh, whether this uh, the service said. Is that uh, like a per uh, per prefix or is it a per verb uh, allocation? In this case, uh, uh, yeah. So this is per prefix, uh, Ketan. Per prefix, uh, at least, yeah. So the mechanism uh, is mainly 
the service prefix advertisement this is option b so the rr scan also will have service for every prefix this uh, will be looked up okay so the suggestion just to maybe clarify that uh, in the draft uh, and i would say perhaps consider uh, upper wharf uh, as well yeah, sure okay then. thanks thank you okay chengli Cheng, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. The first one is that yeah, I don't really understand why we need to uh, like replace the a destination address. Like you said, it's used for uh, achieving uh, achieve, uh, achieving the option C, and I could like to see the text is explicitly in the draft. And the second question is that when the uh, C list uh, contains only one single seat in uh, like uh, uh, binding seat uh, n dot b6 as defined in the RFC 8986. What's the difference between the like end b6 and the uh, end replace, replace six? I can see the action is the same. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah, first one, the yeah, option C, how the procedure works uh, with an example, probably we will update in the subsequent version of the draft. The second one, uh, as I mentioned, it is based on when you start advertising, uh, yeah, we look at the, B the BGP next stop from where this uh, uh, BGP protocol next stop reachability is learned. So if it is only one hop away, we advertise the replace. Uh, if it is uh, if it is not, uh, if there are multiple uh, seats to reach the other domain, then yeah, we will re we will do an additional encapsulation B6. But yeah, depending on the network and where the, where where this is getting stitched to, one of them will be picked uh, based on the situation or, or that characteristics of that uh, particular border node. Yeah, probably we will update with an example so that will be more clear uh, in the draft. Yeah, I think we, we need more clarification of, of this draft. And I am really curious about why we need this, like option C or something like this in the draft. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Hinbin, you're back up. And I'm going to close the queue after Xiaofu because we're getting a little long on time. Okay. Uh, Go I, ahead, I, okay. Okay, thanks, uh, Joy. Uh, uh, Jamin again. Uh, sorry, I, I uh, quick. I, I'm uh, still in the uh, uh, field thinking about this, the purpose of this uh, this type of side uh, seed because you know the SRV six, the major advantage of SRV six can still use the IPv six for wording to traverse the different uh, domains. But for MPRs, it has to uh, keep the huge number of this the uh, forwarding entries for the mapping between the uh, between the labels. So that's the for the IP uh, for the SRV6, we can use the IPv6, and the IPv6 can also use the aggregate to reduce the forwarding entries. So I mean, so this is the advantage of SRV6. But if we introduce this uh, map in C, the uh, in the SRV6, like the SMPRs, I think this is just reduce the advantage of SRV6. That's my concern. Yeah, let me answer it. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, like there are different scenarios. Like, uh, like as you mentioned, if uh, everybody, if the network is properly numbered and everybody has a similar mechanism and everything kind of a press deployment then you have you can even leak srv6 locators across domains and you can get the protocol next up reachability but this is a scenario where there are multiple heterogeneous srv6 domains uh, and they have planned to work together so there is already option c the seamless sr draft talk about that particular use case uh, so and also there could be multiple uh, SRV6 uh, intent paths like uh, the BGP CT or BGP CAR. Uh, so there also automatic stitching has to happen at the border. Uh, so it is for a different use case. But I think it's all all these different mechanisms are really required for different kind of deployments. 
Okay, thank you, Salah. Darren, go ahead. Uh, yeah, first, thanks for the work to, to publish this, and I know it's a revision zero. Um, so I don't expect you to answer this now, uh, but maybe in a, a future revision of the draft. It would be interesting to see how an SR source um, uh, selects one of these uh, behaviors uh, when it builds its path versus, uh, versus another behavior. Um, just to see the cases where uh, these SIDS behaviors are used or not used or one of them are, is used instead of another. Uh, that would be an interesting illustration to see. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we will update that in the next version of the draft. Great. Thank you. Okay. Xiaofu? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the replace seems enough. Why need the replace? Hmm. You seem to have some audio problems, though. It was hard to understand you, and your audio seems to have dropped. May okay, I suggest you put repeat. it in? Uh, can you, uh, my question is very simple. I think uh, the replace seems enough. Why need to replace B6? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, when if you see the diagram, right? So there are uh, IBGP sessions inside AS. So in order to cross one AS, you need multiple uh, uh, multiple seats in that particular AS uh, to uh, be in the SRH. So that's why you need to push uh, an additional SRH at the corresponding ingress border nodes. Uh, so I think this will be clear probably with an example when we mention it in the draft. Okay, so thank okay, you thank all. You. Darren, Shafu, please take yourselves off the queue. Salah, please stop sharing. And uh, Giuseppe, I believe you're up now. Yeah, can you hear me? Can hear you. You need to go use the button at the top to uh, share preloaded slides to share your slides. I will now give you permission. Yeah. And I will let you know as soon as they're visible, and then you may begin. I don't know what causes this delay. There you go. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. This is an update about the SRH encapsulation for alternate marking method. Um, okay. Uh, just a quick recap about what is the alternate marking methodology. I guess m most of you are familiar with this methodology. Uh, this is an OIM passive performance measurement that allow loss delay and delay variation uh, metrics. And this is defined in two RFC in IPPM, RFC 8321 and 8889. Regarding the application to IPv6 data plane, there is already a document in ISG evaluation from six months. Uh, this document defined two new alternate marking option header both top by ops and destination option. Um, of course, this destination option can be applicable to SRV6, to SRH, since destination option before the routing header are processed by uh, each node in the route list. So that is an identity in the SR path. Uh, the, this document defines how the alternate marking is carried as SRH TLB. Uh, SRH TLB, of course, is defined in the RFC 8754. Uh, then we explain why we want to use the SRH TLB in the next uh, slide. Um, yeah, this is just the, um, the format the, of the SRH, the SRH TLB. is the same as we already defined for IPv6, so there is no difference uh, between this TLB and the TLB that we encoded in as a biop or destination option. Uh, so uh, there are two bits that are the marking bits. There is the flow monitor identification that is required uh, to reduce the per node configuration, to simplify the counter handling, um, and also to uh, facilitate the correlation, the data export, and so on. 
And this identification can be assigned by a central controller or by can be pseudo-randomly generated by the source node. Um, regarding the usage of these CLV, um, is all, also in this case, the, the application is the same as we have for, for FPV6. So the ingress node as a part of the SRH, encapsula uh, the SRH encapsulation may add the TLV if it supports the alternate marking functionality. Regarding the intermediate SR node or egress node, uh, if they are capable to, to process the alternate marking TLV, they can simply read the TLV. Uh, they don't need to write, so only uh, check if the TLV is present and read the values of the bits. Otherwise, if the intermediate or egress node are not capable of processing this TLV, this is not a big, a big problem, because if nodes are not capable of processing this TLV, of course, the measurement can be done only for the supporting node. So this is one of the, um, let's say, the advantages of the alternate marking because you don't have, so the intermediate node and uh, ending node do not have to write the option, the TLD. Yeah, in this slide, we are going to explain better the motivation why we need to define the SRH, the SRH the SRH TLV in addition to the destination option. Uh, as I said, the approach with destination option and SRH is already feasible to allow performance measurement for SRV6, for SRH. But the issue is that if we are going to use destination option plus SRH, this requires the usage of two extension headers and uh, as you may know, there is some discussion on the operational implication of adding too, much ex too many extension headers uh, for IPv6. So in the case of uh, SRH, in the case of SRV6, we are investigating this new proposal to use the same option that we already defined for IPv6 uh, to be encoded into the SRH TLV. Of course, this, this document would update the alternate marking application only in the case of SRV6, only in the case of SRH. Indeed, in case of SRH, alternate marking could be applied uh, through the, this TLV, the SRH TLV, but for all the other cases with the PV6 data plane, the use of OB by open destination, op uh, destination option is of course the only choice to carry alternate marking. Um, information and in the end there is no other difference so because the TLV is, is exactly the same uh, another point that we can consider that considering that the, we have a compression design an, SR, an SRH compression design team that is working on uh, the optimization solution for SRV6 as seed compression and SRH implementation this also could also benefit the use of SRH TLV, but it's just um, an hypothesis. So maybe the last, the, the last slide is about the next step. So of course, this is a straightforward way to apply alternate marking to SRV6. Uh, the companion, we can say the companion document, as I said, is an ISG evaluation. And we are open to comment, discussion about this proposal. Um, I hope I have clarified the background and the motivation for this work. Thank you. Ron, go ahead. I understand that sometimes you want altmark functionality in every node along the delivery path. And in that case, you use the HPH. Sometimes you want it only at the ultimate destination, and then you use the destination option. And sometimes you want it only at segment endpoints. Well, when you want it at segment endpoints, you have two choices. One is to encode it in an SRH TLV. The other is just to use the same destination option in a destination options header that precedes the routing header. Why did you choose the TLV in the SRH as opposed to the destination option that precedes the routing header? 
Yeah, I, I also uh, mm, I, I did also mention this before. So uh, you are right. So destination option plus uh, SRH uh, will have the same effect of uh, SRH TLV. So uh, the issue is that this solution is uh, is only applicable in the case of SRH in order to avoid the use of two extension headers that may have uh, some operational issues sometimes um, for a PVC. So it is, a, let's say, a dedicated solution for uh, SRH. And we can say that if accepted, this document um, uh, will suggest or will recommend that for SRH, the only option is to use the SRH TLV and not the destination option plus SRH. So we are going to define a single solution, but not two. Uh, Why would you not want to make it more general and uh, make it work for any other routing header? Um, because, yeah, um, it's just to leverage the this capability of SRH to to be extended to TLV and I understand your point, but um, the solution for for all the routing together is already in the um, six month draft, right? Because here you uh, we are defining the um, the destination option header that of course can be applicable to all the routing together. So this is only for uh, the SRH. Since with SRH we have this. Uh, the possibility to use this kind of TLV, this kind of extension, we aim to leverage in, in, and in our mind, it can be an optimized solution uh, only for SRH, of course. It, it seems like you already have a solution in the destination option and you can put two destination, you know, a destination option before the routing header. So it seems like you're you're coming up with a second solution uh, to a problem you've already solved. Okay, I believe, okay. Giuseppe, you've answered, we need to, that, that topic should be taken to the list as to okay. whether we want to do this or not. Greg has dropped off because I think he was asking the same question. So thank you, Giuseppe, you can stop okay. sharing. Sammy, you're up. There, it's in the process of displaying your slides. I'll let you know when you're when they're visible, and then you can start. You can probably tell yourself when they're visible, but I figure it's nice to know that somebody else is seeing it. It isn't yet visible. Sure, yeah. C can you hear me? I guess. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you for checking that. Still waiting for it to show the slides i it said it was sharing but then i don't see them yeah i don't see them either uh why don't you stop and restart and let's see what happens okay i'll give you permission again a new okay. deck is being shared okay let me... that's better Now at least it's looking the same way we have seen everybody else look. So I assume it will appear in a moment. There you are. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess I can, oh, I can move the slides this way. Okay. I was wondering how they move the slides. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sammy Boutros and uh, I, uh, I'm going to be presenting on behalf of the authors here of the draft. Um, uh, you know, the use how how can we use uh, segment routing uh, concepts uh, applied uh, uh, to uh, the service control plane. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this draft is focusing initially on uh, uh, ELAN uh, service. It's um, Ethernet, uh, an Ethernet service uh, in a LAN environment. 
So, so, so what does it mean to apply uh, the segment routing concept to services here? Um, uh, you know, uh, it's not new that segment routing uh, uh, define an sRGB for services as well. Uh, this uh, could have global significance across uh, the networks who are saying uh, the sRGB concept <clears throat> for services uh, can be used here, uh, which means that every service uh, globally in a given domain uh, will have um, a unique index, right, uh, uh, in that domain. Uh, so uh, it will point to a unique label within this sRGB. So for example, if uh, uh, in a given domain, uh, we are numbering the services uh, for ELAN here, uh, then um, a service numbered 65 could have a service index 65 uh, on all uh, uh, the provider routers or provider edge routers providing that service. So, so, so I think the key here is that uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, segment routing came uh, with, of course, a uh, few concepts here, and uh, the goal was simplicity, meaning, uh, you know, they uh, brought in the concept of uh, simplifying the network, uh, you know, this is what segment routing is about. So, and, and they did a great job in the underlay uh, by eliminating protocols like LDP, for example, uh, uh, in uh, the underlay, uh, the sRGB concept, uh, globalizing the label uh, space across the network. So all those concepts have been applied to the underlay and simplified the underlay control plane greatly. Uh, and the question here, uh, can we use that as well uh, uh, to simplify uh, the control plane for uh, the service? And we are talking about ELAN, for example, here. So going to the next slide. So, uh, so here uh, we are uh, just comparing uh, or, or going back to history here and uh, looking at uh, Sudwar that was the building block for um, uh, ELAN services when applied uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to a service provider network. Uh, so it was the building block uh, that we built over the IP and PLS network. Uh, and historically, the pseudo-war context, uh, you know, was presenting two pieces of information. Uh, was presenting what service we are talking about and what endpoint to. Uh, those two pieces are important, uh, especially if you are going to be doing data plane learning over a pseudo-war. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the node uh, that hosts the pseudo-war here need to know from where the packets are coming. So the endpoint is important. and as well need to know what service uh, uh, is in question here to be able to do the proper data plane Mac learning. Uh, but this uh, uh, combining those two uh, piece of information in one context uh, led to a scale issue. Uh, so for example, if you have 10,000 services uh, configured on a hundred node, uh, then each node would need to maintain 1 million uh, pseudo -war context or 1 million service ID for, those, uh, for all the endpoints in all uh, 10,000 service. Uh, as well, Sudoir really uh, didn't support uh, like uh, legacy layer two network, any active active redundancy. So what we are proposing here, uh, a, 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 you know, as a way to improve the scale for that old technology or, or previous technology uh, is to split uh, the two pieces of information into two contexts. One presenting the service, uh, and here we are talking more about data plane, one presenting the service and one presenting the endpoint. So, so if you imagine, and we'll go more in details in the next slides, uh, that uh, we split those two pieces of information to two SIDs in a SID list, uh, where uh, one will present uh, from where the packet is coming, present the endpoint, and one presents the service, then uh, your scale will look quite different, right? Uh, you would have uh, you know, only uh, 10,000 sets to present uh, the services and the endpoint given that's encoded uh, underneath the service in a header, uh, then, uh, you know, you won't have a scale, the same scale problem that you have with Sudwa. Uh, as well, uh, if we leverage more uh, of the segment routing, uh, uh, you know, uh, concepts here, especially the AnyCast said, 
we can introduce the active active redundancy to that uh, layer two world or that service itself. So this is an illustration on how we can achieve that uh, as well in control plane. So, uh, so we're talking about, uh, you know, how are we going to be uh, in a given domain uh, inside the service provider network, uh, you know, learn dynamically uh, about what services are configured where, right? So uh, what we are proposing here is that if each node would uh, advertise to all other nodes, uh, uh, the services is configured with as a bit mask of all the said offsets, let's say, uh, that uh, it is configured with, then uh, we can really decrease significantly uh, the amount of signaling in uh, the network compared to any previous technology. Because if you imagine the 10,000 service we talked about in the example, and we are trying to advertise those service uh, across the network, and each service is presented by a bit uh, in a signaling message, you could have only one message, uh, one control plane message, by which one node can teach all nodes in the network about what services it's configured with. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's of course a significant uh, decrease in terms of number of control plane messages that can be exchanged. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, instead of a million pseudo R signaling uh, done by a given node, uh, it's only one message that's being sent. So, so one message compared to a million, right? Uh, so, of course, upon receiving that message that's being sent by one node to all other nodes, like as shown here, node 5, for example, is sending what services configured ways to all other nodes, uh, then all other nodes can as well figure out, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh membership uh of nodes in a given service uh, so so typically in layer two network you need to know uh what are the members that uh, uh you know that correspond to the service uh for function like flooding for example because layer two is all especially with data plane mac learning is all about flood and learn so uh so when you flood you need to know who are the members of a given layer two service uh, to be able to flood uh, unknown unicast or broadcast layer two packet to it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so, so now you can learn the membership by simply listening, figuring out from the message sent uh, on all the services with one control plane message, you can figure out for all the services, what are the membership, uh, uh, you know, when you receive that message from other nodes, for example. Um, uh, along with that, uh, we uh, are proposing here uh, as well advertising a broadcast node set. So the broadcast node set uh, is, uh, is, is uh, you know, present a node as well and can tell the node uh, that the received packet is a broadcast packet, meaning it's a flooded packet rather than a unicast packet to the node itself. So the broadcast node set can be thought as, as well uh, a node set uh but of certain nature right okay uh, uh you know that uh, will tell the node whether it's receiving broadcast packet or not right so uh here we are talking initially i think i think uh, uh, the purpose of uh, the initial presentation here is to introduce the concept and and explain how segment routing can significantly uh, uh you know improve in control plane uh for the service or significantly reduce the number of control plane messages that uh, we have with previous technology, uh, and as well uh, improve as well the data plane uh, via the use of a concept like uh, sRGB or segment routing global block. Uh, the next slide here is talking about as well uh, introducing active active redundancy uh, to the old pseudo R technologies that didn't allow that. And in here, we are talking about using uh, any cast set. Uh, you know, I mentioned before that when we build the set list, uh, we can have, uh, uh, you know, the context of what we call the sudoir in the past presented by two, uh, two sets. So as you see here, we have a service set, and then underneath that, we can have uh, uh, what we call a source set. 
So the source said here could be the note said if this is a single home, for example, uh, uh, you know, single home uh, uh, host connected uh, to the provider edge, uh, or could be an anycast said if this is uh, a multi-home device connected to the provider edge for which you are providing, of course, the layer two service. So uh, if uh, the anycast set here is used, then all data plane Mac learning by all nodes is going to be against the anycast set. So any return traffic uh, toward uh, uh, that node, uh, so the provider edges from which we learn uh, uh, the, uh, the source max, for example, for the multi-home service, uh, can uh, it can be uh, ECMP or multipassed here uh, to uh, the devices, both devices uh, shown here in the picture, for example, five and six, uh, who are connected to the multi-home service, right? So, uh, so the multipassing and uh, and even aliasing can uh, can be applied this way. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, uh, and, and and the idea here is uh, any cast uh, uh, is already available in segment routing. So so we are simply using uh, what uh, what's available uh, in the underlay uh, to provide the redundancy and provide the ECMP and the multipassing. Right? Uh, 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 layer two as well is uh, uh, you know is it's important to do what we call stuff like split horizon. So if a packet is flooded, for example, to the network from a multi-home uh, device, we don't want to create a loop. Uh, so, so we need to make sure that when it arrives to another device connected to the same multi-home site, uh, that that packet will not be looping back. Uh, and, and that easily as well can be done uh, uh, because uh, Node 6 uh, uh, co-share or co-own uh, the Anycast set. So if it's receiving the packet source from an Anycast set, it will know uh, how to do the proper split horizon here. Um, you know, this is going more into some more details about data plane Mac learning and uh, how can we do that? How can we learn against the source set uh, for, uh, you know, uh, the Mac addresses, uh, uh, source Mac received in data traffic uh, from single home uh, as shown here from node three, for example, or even from multi-home as we're showing uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so, so that's as well uh, is available uh, in the SID list and, and we can learn easily uh, for a given service against the source SID, the MAC addresses, uh, you know, uh, for a given service. So uh, going to the next slide. I, I mean, this is more going more into details of uh, how can we do some ARP suppression. And uh, in here we are talking about uh, flooding ARP replies as well, so all nodes can learn uh, the IP MAC binding. Yeah, actually, maybe a, a little history about ARP suppression. Uh, ARP suppression is calling for, uh, you know, decreasing the flooding of ARP packet across the network. Uh, and the way to do that is uh, uh, by doing uh, the ARP suppression, which means that a node can respond to an ARP request, uh, uh, you know, uh, on behalf of the destination. So, so here the PE router can respond uh, to an ARP request uh, on behalf of the ultimate destination. And the way it does that by gleaning ARP requests and replies to know about the IP MAC binding. And uh, here, uh, of course, ARP requests are uh, always flooded, but ARP replies aren't. And, uh, and in here, uh, we are saying if you flood the ARP replies, uh, then uh, the gleaning of IP MAC binding can happen. And nodes can learn, of course, about that. Um, uh, here uh, again, this is uh, as well a very important point that uh, uh, that we will uh, mention here quickly uh, is uh, uh, the idea of convergence. And uh, you know, if uh, for example, here we have node five and node six connected to the multi-home device, and uh, if one of the nodes lose connectivity to that multi-home device. Uh, uh, what we can do. So, uh, uh, as as you mentioned, uh, uh, we are using an Anycast set, uh, and maybe I should stress on that point as well more, uh, pair Ethernet segment or pair multi-home Ethernet segment. So, if one node attached to a multi-home Ethernet segment 
lose connectivity to that uh, multi-home Ethernet segment, then it can withdraw, okay, uh, the, any cast said associated with that segment. Uh, and uh, th that doing that withdrawal in the underlay network will simply give us the convergence, right? So we, we really don't need to do much more, right? I think what's presented here uh, is uh, in the interim before withdrawing, if node five would detect that the link, uh, uh, you know, or the interface connected to the multi-home segment uh, is, uh, or multi-home device, of course, right? Uh, uh, is down, then uh, it can, in the interim, uh, redirect packet to other nodes connected to that multi-home device uh, until uh, the network converge and uh, and, and 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 things uh, go in track back again, right? Uh, so uh, again, uh, we already talked about that the ECMP multipassing, right? And so, I mean, how, uh, yes, 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 but I, I'm I'm concluding. I'm concluding. Uh, so uh, finally, the two takeaways that we want to take from this uh, is uh, the Ethernet Layer 2 service we are talking about presenting it by Global SID in uh, each domain, and that will decrease uh, massively, uh, uh, you know, uh, the number of state we can keep in data plane, and uh, will decrease drastically as well uh, as the control plane signaling uh, needed. Uh, and the other takeaway, which is extremely, is as important, uh, is there is no need really for doing any service convergence, right? You know, like uh, uh, typically uh, as overlay layer, we always talk about converging the overlay, converging the overlay, and, and defining mechanisms for converging the overlay. By the use of any cast said, uh, the problem become an underlay convergence, and there is no need to do any overlay conversions, right? So, so that's a key takeaway. Uh, finally, the last slide is talking about a benefit in general. Um, you can go over it. Uh, the slides are uploaded uh, and uh, the draft is available too. And with that, I can conclude. Okay. Um, I'm going to close the queue at this point, but I do want to let the three people who are there comment and ask questions. And I do recommend you go over to the chat and look at some of the questions that have been posted there and respond there and keep them in mind for mailing list discussions. Patrice? Patrice Brizet, you're up. Um, please unmute, I'm not hearing anything. Okay, Patrice will try once again when we get to the end of the queue. Eric? Yes, thank you, Joel, and thank you, Sami, for the presentation. And thank just you. one thing, the draft and your slides, I got a section about IPv4 ARP, and I see nothing about IPv6 NDP. Is it the intent to add IPv6 support later? Uh, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, good question, Eric, yeah. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, the use of network function and SRV6 uh, is, uh, is in. I think we, the purpose, Eric, again, is just to introduce the concept, but of course the mechanics and the, the more details, even the signaling aspect will come later. Okay, thank you, Sami. Thank okay. you. Ma Matthew, Tarek, I said I clo was closing the queue. So, Matthew, your turn. Yeah, hi, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Sammy, I just got a quick question about the relationship of this draft to one you had in BESS um, about a year uh, ago. That was very similar. And uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, um, that's a good question, Matthew. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Could you just clarify what the int your intention is with the best draft? Because I would have thought that this, um, given this relates to BGP signal services, should really like live in in BESS. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, I think the idea here, uh, uh, Matthew, uh, is, uh, you know, we thought that the concept is more a segment routing concept. So, so this is why uh, we thought that the concept will present uh, here in spring, but the signaling aspect and the more details about that will be presented in best for sure, right? So, so, so we will update the best draft to more address the signaling aspect and how we can achieve that. And here we discuss more the architecture and the concept. 
Okay, I'd, I'd encourage encourage you to clarify that in the in the two drafts because they look very similar at the moment. Yeah, 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 that, definitely. Yeah, definitely a, a good point. And yeah, we will uh, we will be updating the best draft to more address the signaling and uh, of course the BGP uh, signaling for services. Definitely. Okay, thanks. Thanks, the spring man. chairs will coordinate with the best chairs to make sure that the right material is discussed in the right working group. Excellent. Yeah. Patrice, I'll give you one more shot if you can speak. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? There you are. Yes, please. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, hey, Sami. I hope you're doing well. Hey, hey Sami. A, a, a bit along the same comment than Matthew, because I think I was first in the queue. So I had that comment, but also, is there any difference with the two drive right now? The one uh, no, no, that you're going reason, uh, you're, you're right. You're right, Patrice. As I mentioned to Matthew, uh, uh, you know, there is no difference between the two drafts, but uh, but the plan is to uh, change the other draft to more add the signaling aspect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Sammy. If you will now stop sharing, and as soon as he does so, Jibo, if you would then step forward and start and select your presentation. Shenbin, are you presenting the intent-based routing material? Uh, yes. Uh, will I share the screen or you share? You, you, you should use the share preloaded slides button at the top. Our, your screen is being started. As soon as it shows up, I'll let you know and mute myself. What? Okay, you're up. Uh, Again, yes. Give your permission again. We'll wait. Matthew, you seem to be unmuted. Please mute yourself. Thank you. Uh, hello, Joey. Can you help me share my slides? Okay, I'll I will do it. So let me okay, use the thanks. intent based. Let me make sure I find this right one. This one. Share. Okay. Okay, I can see the screen. Okay, there it is. Can... You'll have to tell okay. me when to move to the next slide. Okay. Uh, this is Jimmy from Huawei, intent based routing. Okay, here are the introduction. Uh, in fact, the seamless uh, MPRS uh, segment routing describes the requirement for end-to-end intent-based paths spanning multiple domain networks. Uh, in order to implement the seamless uh, segment routing, uh, the uh, SR paths uh, need to set up according to the pair, uh, color, and uh, endpoint. Uh, it means more SR paths need to be introduced in the multiple domain. Uh, in the multiple domain, so this uh, means that not only to set up SR paths for the per endpoint, but also set up the SR paths per pair, color, and endpoint. Uh, so this proposes a challenge on the scalability. Uh, in order to reduce the scalability challenge, this document proposed the intent-based routing mechanism. Uh, through the mechanism, uh, the intent information can be carried in the data plane, and the network node can steer the packet into the SR policy to satisfy the service requirement. Uh, so that means it is not to set up the end-to-end -end pass, uh, SR pass uh, prepare. Uh, so that's uh, uh, not only to the steering the packet into the SR policy according to the intent-based routing, uh, the mechanism can also be used to steering the traffic into the uh, underlying network slicing uh, to meet the specific intent and also enforce the policy for other intent. Uh, 
such as the network environment and the security, etc. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here this is the uh, first uh, page of the introduction about intent based routing. So, first, uh, this is the two concept that's the color. Uh, so, that's the color is defined in the segment routing uh, policy. Uh, so that's uh, the 32 bit numeric value that associates the SR policy uh, with uh, intent. So that uh, means, uh, for example, the intent is uh, low latency, uh, low latency, etc. Uh, so means this uh, color can be associated the uh, so, uh, SR policy in the control plane. Uh, the intent. Uh, so that's uh, mean the new concept. The this uh, intent based routing mechanism. Neutral, uh, introduce the concept of the intent. Uh, this means the intent information, uh, which, is, which is carried in the data plane uh, to represent the specific uh, service requirement uh, for the destination on the network. Uh, so uh, there also can be the mapping between the intent and the color in the, uh, uh, in the node. That means the intent X can be mapped to the color Y. So that means if they had a similar, uh, similar uh, uh, intent uh, uh, information, so that can be this the mapping. Uh, besides this, the mapping, because this uh, the intent can also be used for other purposes, such as the network measurement and the security, uh, etc. Uh, because the color is always associated with the SR policy for the uh, purpose of steering traffic. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here this is an example. So that's uh, uh, the <coughs> in order to simplify the inter-domain routing. So that's in one local domain. So there also can be set up a SR policy group, which is shown in the figure. So that's the SR policy uh, group. A uh, group includes the mapping between colors and the SR policies for a specific uh, endpoint. So here we can see that this is the mapping between the color one and the SR policy one, and the color two for the SR policy two uh, for the specific endpoint. Uh, because this is the SR policy group can be set up. And there's also the mapping between the intents, uh, intent and the color. So when the packet uh, arrived at the edge of the uh, network domain, so that's uh, the network node can according can search the fib, uh, can search this the SR policy uh, using the destination address in the packet. Uh, uh, <coughs> so then uh, find the SR policy group go on to use the intent information in the packet to map to the corresponding color, then corresponding the SR policy. So means that use the destination and the intent information in the packet can search the corresponding SR policy for a specific endpoint. So then steering the traffic to the SR policy. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, uh, the color mechanism can also used to set up the mapping uh, between the color and the underlying network slice. So that's uh, we use that's the color uh, can use to for the unified uh, unified mapping process of traffic steering. That means uh, the color can be used for uh, for the. Uh, for identify the SR policy, can also use uh, to identify the specific underlying network slice. So when the packet uh, arrive at the network edge node, the network edge node can uh, abstract the uh, can derive the intent information from the packet, and uh, according to the mapping between the intent and the color, to find this corresponding the color, then corresponding the under, underlying network slice. So that you steering the packet into the underlying network slice. And in the underlying network slice, and you use the destination, destination address can search the FIB and go on to be forwarded in the underlying network slice. 
Okay, next slide. Sorry. So next slide. There. Okay. There. Okay. So this is the last page about the intent based routing. So this is the scalability. Uh, we have this the advantage of scalability because this uh, mapping between the intent and the SR policy can be done locally uh, without the need of advertising the label binding for the pair, color, and the point to stitch the SR pass spanning uh, multiple domains. And also there's the flexibility because the same intent can be satisfied by the SR policy or the underlying network slice. So the local network domain can choose the different solutions uh, uh, to uh, satisfy the same uh, intent. That means in one, uh, for the same intent, in one network domain can use the SR policy, another network domain can use the underlying network slice. So that's is for the end-to-end -end, uh, traverse the packet. So that's the kind of flexibility to choose the different solutions in the different domain. So that is combined together to satisfy the intent. So this is can improve the flexibility of the intent uh, inter-domain routing. But uh, uh, I think this is an advantage because now according to the seamless SR, it can always use, uh, it, uh, in order to satisfy the intent, it always use the SR pass. It's a, a little difficult to combine the uh, SR policy and the underlay network slice. Okay, and last one, that's the advantage of extensibility because that's uh, besides steering the packet into the SR policy or the underlay network slice for the uh, SRA guarantee, the network node can also enforce the policy for other possible intents such as the network management and the security and the other possible intent. Okay, last slide. Okay. Hello, okay. Oh, sorry, not the last. So here, this is just a simple illustration. So we can see that the uh, weeping seed can be advertised from the P1 to the CSD1. And also the SR policy group can be set up in the uh, AS1 and also the SR policy group can be set up in the AS2. So that's the packet, the end to uh, the uh, inter-domain routing uh, can be illustrated. So that's the when the payload to arrived, so that the intent can be carried. And also this the VPN seed can be encapsulated. Uh, and also uh, according to the intent information can map to the corresponding the SR policy uh, in the SR policy group. So that's the segment list for the SR uh, policies uh, candidate path can be encapsulated uh, for the traffic steering. So when arrive on the ASBR1, so that's in the packet, uh, so the segment list can be removed, can use the VPN seed to search the fib and traverse the packet from the ASBR1 to the ASBR3. So here, that's a go on to according to the intent information in the packet and to map to the uh, corresponding. Zendin, the we need to pick okay. up the pace here. We're running out of time. We've got two okay. more presentations. OK, so that's uh, all done. So that's uh, you find the SR policy in the AS2 and the segment list be encapsulated to steer in the traffic arrive and the PE1. So this is just a illustration. OK, next slide. Okay, so the this is the next step. So this is the first version. So that we would like to solicit the comments and refine the draft and welcome the cooperation. Okay. Okay, Linda, you may ask your question, but other than that, the mic line is closed because we are running very late on time. I'm sorry. Okay, I just have a clarification question. So is that intent perform the similar function as um, like uh, um, policy? Uh, almost like a, a QoS kind of function, similar to QoS um, in a way that you can de steer the traffic, give another layer of policy matching criteria? Yes. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, you similar, but uh, to be more uh, exact, uh, exact uh, you like the color, that means the intent, uh, such as this uh, low latency or the high bandwidth. 
not only is just uh, the DSCP, this is the code point. Oh, okay, okay. So the payload itself indicates this um, bandwidth requirement or the latency requirement. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, some of this is abstract in uh, intent. That's uh, not a uh, detailed uh, service requirement. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you both. Jisang, okay. you're, you're up. If you will request to present, I will give you permission. Oh, it's not working. Okay, I will present this. I make sure I get the right thing. Multicast, okay. There you are, I'm going to slide two. You have only a few slides, which is good, but please proceed quickly. Song. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay. There, yes, can hear you. Go ahead. Ah, thank you. Um, hi, I will introduce our uh, work about source segment for uh, MSR6. Briefly, the first page. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, I will introduce the concept of source segment. Uh, SRV6 uh, seed is defined to be used as destination address in RFC 8402, but in some case, an SRV6 seed is also allowed to be used in the source address. Uh, for example, when the ping request packet is an SRV6 packet and the echo reply will use the SRV6 seed of the request packet as the source address. Uh, in this document, we introduced the concept of uh, source address for uh, IPv6 multicast packet. Next page, please. Um, more precisely, the source segment in this document is used for uh, MVPN service in uh, IPv6 network. Uh, generally, in the multicast service, a packet is replicated along the tree towards a set of leaf nodes. Uh, in this case, MVP routing and the corresponding information could be encapsulated in the source segment carried in the IPv6 source address. And uh, this source segment for MVPN is distributed by the root node and the function is excluded by the leaf nodes. Uh, similar as the group of uh, end.dt functions uh, defined in RFC uh, 8986, uh, this document defines a set of behaviors uh, that can be associated with source segment for MVPN, just as list uh, the table here. Uh, next page. Uh, thank you. Uh, here we list some benefits which can be brought by the source segment, um, especially for the case of MVPN. First, the source segment is unchanged along the P2MP path compared to the destination address. Uh, and it could enhance the networking capability um, by allowing more functions in the source space. Um, and also the symmetric uh, of uh, source address could reuse the IPv6 address allocation and management method, uh, or it can have a similar one. Mm, next page, please. Mm, what is the next? Uh, actually, uh, we think it is a proper time to raise this topic in spring because this question of uh, seed appeared in source address field has already been mentioned during the discussion of services compression. And we believe this document could give a clear concept and, and um, valid use case for source segment. 
Um, but honestly, for further work, we believe uh, more clarifications will be helpful. Just as mentioned in the request of the AD's email, maybe there will be a new document for this, uh, especially from the view of IPv6. Okay, that's all. Thank you. It's on the queue, and then we have to move on to the last presentation. Torlis, you, you'll you'll go up after this finishes. Ron, go ahead. Yes. Um, what happens when a packet has a SID as its source address, and for some reason it can't be forwarded, and the node that cannot forward it sends an ICMP message to that source address? Uh, I think this case, the source address is still rootable, just like uh, as R A six seed in the destination address. Where and does the if this, hmm? where does the um, ICMP message go? Where does it terminate? Just to the to the locator of the source address, the locator part. It is uh, still rootable. Just uh, the VPN MVPN information can be carried in the such as argument part of the seed, just like an SRP6 seed destination address. So the low order okay. bits are totally ignored at the source. Uh, Ron, that's a detail we need to take to the list. Zhao Hui, sorry if I mispronounced it, your question. Uh, a comment. Uh, this concept was first brought up. Uh, in the beer working group, uh, when, when we did, when they uh, wanted to do the uh, IP SRV6 style um, beer for MVPN, there were a lot of discussions on the on the mailing list, mainly from me, uh, on on the, on the issues with uh, with this pr proposal. I think uh, we should re revive that discussion there. Uh, actually, okay. I think this this is not for beer or some a specific mechanism. This can be used for any IPv6 based multicast to carry MVPN. And we also discussed this in the uh, section six of the document. Maybe you can review it. And thank you for the comments. Okay. Torlis, you're up. Okay, let me find it. Uh, is it all the way on the bottom? Okay, so yeah, there we go. Sure. There you okay. are. So, um, this idea here was uh, introduced in ITF 111, originally targeted for industrial networks. And um, so this came out of the question what can we do better with? Um, variable length addresses. And it only mentions in, in a side how it would be beneficial in, in our opinion for current service provider networks. So I wanted to lay this out as something which I think at the core could really help spring in the long term um, because I think we're going to see a lot more um, customers coming into um, you know our service provider type network use cases without 20 years of V6 and MPLS preferences. And uh, when they're looking at what they can be doing with Spring, I think one of the most obvious feedbacks would be, so why is IETF only continuing to enhance two parallel forwarding planes? Both have downsides, the other solves better. Um, and one common forwarding plane with the best of both worlds would be quite logical. It avoids duplication of expertise, development, software, hardware deployment, and the limitations. And I think that's really you know, one of the core questions Spring should ask itself. Uh, for um, uh, you know the the long term, um, we have unified SR architecture as much as possible. What we do not have a forward uh, forwarding plane unification, right? And obviously, the current working group structure for execution isn't suited to achieve something like that because we only have working groups that uh, are there to maintain the legacy. Um, and you know, just imagine how quick would have turned out if we would have been put into the TCPM working group, right? So, and that legacy is quite different from the operator requirements, which we do understand thin ways, low operational churn, complexity limitation, yada, right? So that's basically the motivation. Now, obviously any of that motivation doesn't help if we don't have ideas on how to do better and how we could unify. So let me quickly explain how I think all the things we are doing, you know, uh, differently in um, MPLS and um, 
as RV6 could be, you know, uh, done um, more comprehensively in a single flexible addressing um, uh, approach. Um, and the main point is that the addresses uh, of each node can be variable length um, and uh, no address can be a prefix of another so that you do own uh, all the suffixes. So, for example, routers one and two here on the picture are um, the ones uh, most often used as edge routers, so they have shorter addresses. And then um, the, um, the address is constructed as a sequence of, um, uh, you know, one such node prefix um, followed by a sequence of commands, uh, zero or more, each uh, with its, uh, you know, optional parameters. Um, and uh, that could be a superset of the existing SR commands. Let's say the most simple one, obviously, being something like receive, um, which could be the value four for four bit command, uh, receive into a VPN, which might be have a parameter, OEM punt, and so on. So, uh, how then would we do the most important thing, which is the uh, source steering? Um, and uh, here is the example with the loose steering where we simply have a sequence of the node prefixes, some local commands here for the first node, command one with a parameter, then command two being the steer parameter. And um, with respect to how node one interprets the address, well, it's basically the rest of the address is just the parameter to the um, steer command. Uh, so it basically uh, takes the parameter, uh, looks at the first uh, part of it, which is the next hop node, um, and then it passes on um, the address in a way that that node two um, and any intermediate uh, hops toward it would uh, start interpreting uh, the address at that stage. And so it goes on. And as you can see, we don't uh, mandate um, uh, additional uh, local commands on the nodes, uh, like we are wasting the space in um, S SRH, um, and, uh, but we can very easily have them. Um, so the address encoding, um, you know, if we simply sp uh, strip the prefix of the address on each of these steering hops, we'll basically have an MPLS style um, address handling, right? We're popping things uh, from the beginning of the address. We can equally do the SRH style. That, that's a decision to make uh, when we ever get to an encoding of this uh, by simply having um, a prefix that we chain, uh, sorry, an, an, an offset, you know, address interpretation offset that we uh, progress in the same way as we do that in SRH. Um, now, um, the variable length uh, introduces some uh, new challenges to whether we have, uh, you know, inconsistency in routing in the configuration of the nodes, uh, which will impact the um, decoding, uh, which so far in um, SRH and MPLS is because it's fixed size not happening. And we can also easily overcome that by introducing, uh, you know, a prefix length argument that makes sure that whoever is, uh, you know, generating an address um, will, um, you know, have the same interpretation of the, the first node prefix uh, to um, analyze uh, as, as the receiver has. And uh, if not, then that would erase an error and stop the forwarding of the packet. Um, the very same um, elimination of new um, challenges with variable length for the variable length addresses can, can also be done. Um, we have different uh, ways uh, on how we can, you know, manage address space for commands. Uh, so far, we've typically done it by fixing them through the standard, which gives the strongest consistency. They could be pre-configured across the network, which is fairly strong consistency, or they could be managed by the IGP. So uh, to make sure that we're uh, not having inconsistencies across them, we should definitely standardize uh, the address space um, uh, so that it is always clear um, what address, what length, and whether it is fixed by standard, pre-configured, or dynamically assigned. So I think um, this is just high level to see how we can eliminate the new um, consistency challenges through variable length addresses. Um, and uh, that basically gets us to, you know, how could we start looking at a common header? Um, and this, this is basically a simple idea on how to start with an IPv6 header, strip it down to take out all the things that we may not want if the semantic we're preferring is more towards MPLS. The source address could be completely optional. Um, uh, the destination address is really that uh, instruction that we had. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can give a long rant about that we should get rid of a lot of the legacy QS that we have and make it uh, into an, an, an options header. 
but so we bas basically would uh, arrive at a very uh, compact header uh, that was very flexible. Um, so uh, obviously there's a lot of functionality beyond addressing. So this would just be the start to, to show that we can have a unified addressing structure, which makes uh, the spring architecture more flexible and easily extensible uh, with uh, the best of both worlds of MPLS and V6, right? Obviously, you know, we need to discuss what we think about, you know, other uh, differences in the forwarding, like, you know, um, is uh, MTU discover better done out of band or in band? Um, and then, of course, also backward compatibility, right? And um, I think the question is really how much backward compatibility do we need? Um, not that we need it. And uh, in the most easy case, one can see that with this new encoding, you can simply map all the existing MPLS and SRV6 into it. But is that really what we want? Uh, and that's basically it, right? So this this is kind of hopefully a somewhat inspiring uh, thought about how we can, you know, uh, do a lot more when we come up with the very simple, um, flexible addressing mechanisms and hopefully, you know, long term uh, evolve into something where uh, Spring has a sim single unified forwarding plane. Um, you know, cute, small um, dogs. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for your time and please take it to the list. Contact me directly uh, if you're interested in this. Obviously, this is not something that can be done overnight, but uh, I'd really appreciate any feedback. Okay. Let me observe. The chairs have not had have not discussed this, but it is very questionable whether discussing this fits at all within the Charter of Spring. Of course, I, I'm not asking whether the IETF should discuss it, but it is very unclear whether it fits within Spring. And yeah. we are now at the top of the hour, so I want to thank everybody, and uh, we will uh, see you down the road. Stay well.